What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Couple Things. With Sean and Andrew. A podcast all about couples. And the things they go through. If Sean sounds out of breath, it's because <laughs> she is. She actually got uh, tested for COVID today, although yeah. came up negative. Yes. But you are sick in I some do capacity. have a cold. <laughs> um, we're bummed because today was going to be our first live stream show. Yes. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna start doing live stream solo episodes when we're not doing interviews. Uh, that's going to go on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and that way... We can actually get questions live yes. as they come in and, and we talk about the topic of the day. But we're not bummed because today's guest <laughs> yes. is epic. Oh my gosh. I loved talking to this couple. They, Andrew and I have had really, really deep conversations ever since we talked to this couple. I'll let you introduce them in a second. They said something about teaching kids about history that has shook me to the core and I think is one of the most beautiful things one of the most brilliant things I've ever heard. And it's just, it's such a no-brainer. And you'll hear it. Don't worry. So we sit down with Aloe Black and his wife, Maya, both musicians um, and really phenomenal thinkers, I think. Phenomenal talents at their mm -hmm. craft. I enjoyed this conversation because Aloe and his wife had some phenomenal wisdom to share. So I'm going to let you guys sit back and listen to it. And we'll save Sean her voice. <laughs> yes. But before we jump into the show, we should say that Aloe recently released a new album called all love everything it just came out in october so we'll link that down below and if you want to find out what these two are up to we will include their information all the links to everything in the show notes down below so check that out and if you haven't subscribed to the show or given a rating please do so it helps us out we love hearing what you have to say but without further ado i bring you aloe black and his wife maya All right, Alo, Maya, thank you so much for joining us on the show. It's a pleasure to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Nice thank to you. meet you. Thanks for having us. Um, wow. Well, we're going to have a fantastic conversation. I'm really excited. I understand that you guys have been in Los Angeles. You guys live in Los Angeles. How long have you guys been there? I've been here my whole life, basically. I grew up in wow. Southern California. Uh, Maya came in 2008. Yes, I've been here 13 years. Wow. Uh, Maya, would you mind sharing <laughs> yes. your origins? Yes. Um, I grew up in Australia, in Sydney, Australia, um, but I was born in Mexico. My father's Mexican, my mom is Turkish, and we migrated to Australia when I was one. And then I decided that wasn't enough, so I migrated to the United States um, when, I, when I met Alo, fell in love and decided to test things out. And so far, two kids later, I'm still here. Pass the test. <laughs> <laughs> you could say things are getting pretty serious in between you two. Then, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So the first question we always ask anybody on our show is take us back to the moment you guys met each other for the first time. Wow. All right. Okay. <laughs> the moment I met Maya for the first time, I was at a music conference in uh, Melbourne and she was the national television and national radio voice for hip hop. And I was just this uh, up and coming artist and I was um, trying to promote my music and I somehow was able to get an interview on her show. That's a low key way of saying I interviewed him and that's how we met. <laughs> wow. Hey, very romantic. It's a first actually for the show. So. I mean, I feel like it's worth, what, what questions did you, <laughs> yeah ask Maya that won him his heart over this must have been an intense interview right <laughs> yeah and I cringe when I watch it back like I can't because I you can see me smiling from ear to ear and I never oh! dated before so just putting that out there I mean she <laughs> all the celebrities she had her pick of the litter and she <laughs> chose me she looked she saw this was like low low price stock <laughs> because it's through the roof. Oh, Wait, okay, so I'm curious, what was it about the interview or about each other that you were like, this Got person, this person I like? So I was in radio and I, it's so funny because I really remember having this thought of, you know, a stack of CDs on my desk, I'm, I'm going through the mail, I'm listening to, because, you know, I spend most of my day just listening to music, what am I going to play that, that evening? I was doing a hip hop show. And I, I got his album and I saw it was from Stone's Throw, so I recognized the label. I'm listening to the music, the influences. I start reading his bio 
Um, his parents are from Panama. He's first generation American. Um, and a lot of his early stuff had uh, Latin influences in the music. It had reggae and um, dance hall, soul, hip hop. It was all the things, as a hip hop artist myself, was all the things that inspired me. And I remember the distinct thought, reading the bio going, man, if I lived in LA, we'd be friends. <laughs> we'd be friends, like we'd hang out. We'd, maybe we would collaborate, make some music together. And just kind of feeling, sometimes, you know, being in Australia, it's a beautiful country, but you do feel very separated from the rest of the world. Like you're so far away from the action, especially LA, you know, where it all happens. So, um, but I, I just thought that, and I, I thought I knew straight away that we had similar inspirations musically. And I thought just on a, on a hip hop peer to peer level, we would get along. Mm. So she, she made the interview happen. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Okay, so after the interview. Wait, can okay. I interrupt? Yeah, Maya, you can interrupt. <laughs> well, hold on. I, a couple of things. Maya, can you say Panama again? Panama. <laughs> That's cool. I've never heard anybody say it like that. That is, that is like authentic. How did you say it? I was trying to say <laughs> Don't worry. But in Panama, they say Panama. Yeah. <laughs> Ala, you got to say it now. I got to. Panama. Okay, okay, okay. I mean, can you try it out? No, nope. no. <laughs> okay. and then wait, I gotta know who followed up. Alla, were you like, like, did you flip and ask Maya a question during the interview? You're like, can I get your number though? So, um, how, did, how did that happen? So, it was a vi so we're a video, the show I was hosting is a video channel, so he wanted to give me the his DVD, which had the video clip, so we could play the video with the interview. Come, he says, come to the um after party um well, no no no. it was like the dinner yeah so at the, at the music conference that i was at red bull music academy i had a dvd that i could give her so she could play my music video on the on her show and then he invited uh. me to the after party of the academy i invited him to the to a hip-hop australian hip-hop event that was happening i worked till like midnight that night and after that night i was like hmm do I, he's not here. And I, and I go, do I go or don't I go? And I had this feeling of like, I don't really want to, cause I don't want to, <laughs> you know, you know, groupie or anything like that. And I was like, stuff it. I'm just going to do it. So I jumped in a cab. I went by myself. I didn't bring any friends. <laughs> cause I was like, just in case. Um, <laughs> and he was <laughs> at the front of the venue waiting for a cab to leave. And I, I thought she wasn't going to show up. I waited all night. And I oh, man. arrived in the taxi and then he sees me and gives me a big hug and says, you came. And then we just drank orange Aww. juice. And that was. <laughs> Look at Aloe cheesing. Aloe's reliving it right now. This is great. That's this cute. warms my heart, guys. <laughs> so it was me. I chased. <laughs> I love that. Oh, okay. So then you guys start dating, talking. Yeah, talking um, sort of over over the internet. Um, then Grammys week in the U.S. came around and her television network sent her to the U.S. to interview all the big stars again. And her producer said, just in case one of the big stars fall through, line up some um, indie, indie groups that you can also interview. So mm. I also had an indie group. I was a solo artist. <laughs> I had a group with a DJ named Exile, and she yes, interviewed Eminem. my group. Mm. I was like, <laughs> let me call. <laughs> February, Grammys always falls around Valentine's week, and I asked her out for a Valentine's concert to go see Wyclef at the House of Blues. Ooh, That's wow. That's amazing. Dang, that puts our first date to shame. <laughs> yeah. Dang. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you go on your first date, how how does this progress and then how long until proposal marriage wow okay first date so february, february? 07 february 07 i move over april 2008 oh yeah one year one year of long okay. distance communication and then we got married 2010 yeah, there was no Zoom back then. It was only Skype. Was only Skype. <laughs> yes. Which Wait, is, did you have the like terrible. Skype camera that you had to like 
attach the top of your computer. Yeah. Yeah. So did we. Wow. Yes. And actually buy like Skype credit to call. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Buy I still have like 20 bucks on Skype anyway. Uh-huh. Yeah. iPhones didn't exist yet with FaceTime. So, right. Mm. You know, this is all very early. Pre-smartphone. Technology. How did you guys, uh, how, how did you find your long distance experience? Was it a lot of like T9 texting, you know, the flip phone action? <laughs> how did you make it through it? I guess is what I'm asking. It was horrible. Um, we saw it <laughs> like three times in a year. We met in Hawaii, which was, I think, so after, so after that February 1st date, when did we meet in Hawaii? I want to say April, but I can't. I think it was May. Okay. We were <laughs> talked every day and So I would call him on my way home from work, which would be morning time in LA. Oh, the time change. As I'm driving through traffic and the next day, I'm a day forward, by the way. Wow. As I'm driving through traffic, he's waking up and we're just talking. So we we spoke every day um, and eventually it was like, okay, we need to see each other. Like, Mm -hmm. because you know what's going on. And I, again, I, man, I'm really responsible for this relationship. Yeah, she's. <laughs> I, purchased, I purchased my flight. Um, I purchased my ticket. We, we talked about when in our calendars were, was there a window of like five days. Mm-hmm. And he was touring and, you know, doing all kinds of stuff. And I was working three jobs. Like I'm on TV, radio, plus um, I have my own music. So I'm working like six days a week. So I was like, okay, this is the window that, that it can happen. I go on orbits and book my flight. Wow. And I sent him the email and I was like, I'm going to be in Hawaii on these dates. What are you doing? <laughs> Where are you going? That's awesome. Oh, my gosh. And Aloe <laughs> stepped up and made plays, huh? I had, to, I had to buy my ticket and then I was like, okay, I got the hotel room. And... Um, <laughs> Uh, made the arrangements for a hotel, and when we when I got to Hawaii, I was there s- before she got there, so um, I just went and like decked out the suite with all kinds oh of uh, treats and food, and and I, I got a couple of lays, and when she showed up, I had a sign that said. Um, Maya Dawkins, Maya, Maya Dawkins. So instead of her last name, I put my last name. And, um, <laughs> He's done. and so she got off the airplane and sees this sign. And then I put the lay on her and went to the hotel room. And never what? Wait. Did like a proposal come after that? It wasn't. You... Proposal came like a year. Uh, two years, years later. later. You yeah. used the last name two years this before you got guy married guy is the most romantic I dude mean, alive hey, take notes take notes oh okay. my how did okay i want to hear the proposal story because it's obviously going to be epic no, it's not <laughs> it doesn't need to be your entire relationship was already epic this is like you, we could speak a whole hour on this conversation and by the way we just released our our whole like um footage uh, camera of that rolling. hawaii trip of that Hawaii trip, it's on uh, the everything lyric video. Wow. So if you look at his lyric video for all of everything, you'll see Polaroids of um, yeah, the of, whole Hawaii trip of that entire. So oh, like, we're hey. bought in now. Dang, I need to go got, watch everything. I got chills. I need, this is yeah. Dope. We're gonna be like, this is what they're talking about. This yeah. Okay. Dang. Anyway, um, the proposal. Proposal. <laughs> I wasn't prepared. I didn't. <laughs> No, I was going to ask her to marry me when I did, but I just felt like it was the moment I wanted to, and I didn't have a ring. <laughs> we so, were on a plane heading to Mexico. We were, we're already in there. We were, we were, we're already in Mexico. In Mexico. We were flying we, from one point. <laughs> amazing trip through Mexico, the Yucatan Peninsula, going from you know Mayan ruins to the beaches and mis- visiting some of her family in Cancun. Chichen Itza, Palenque, so pyramids. I saw oh, my grandpa. When they say it. And so we're taking yeah. off from like one part of Mexico to land in another part of Mexico. And I look out the window and there's this beautiful sunset. And I look over at her and I'm like, I just want to spend the rest of every sunset with you. Will you marry me? On the plane? On the plane. <laughs> and I was like, 
what? <laughs> are you, you're like, are you proposing to me? I don't see a ring. Anywhere, but... <laughs> She's like, the seatbelt sign's on. You can't even get on your knee. <laughs> I said yes, but I'm thinking, okay, what? Like, I'm just uh, not thinking this is real. Yeah. So we arrive to my auntie and uncle's house, and he tells them that we're engaged. And I was like, when I engaged, and he's like, yeah, you said yes. And I was like, where's the <laughs> ring? So he makes a ring out of, I'm going to say aluminum, right? Mm-hmm. Is that right? Uh, aluminum. Al- yeah. Al- yeah. <laughs> <laughs> An origami oil. ring out of a chewing gum. And I still have it, by the way. I still have it. That's adorable. Here you go. And, I, and I just laughed, but, you know, eventually he proposed again when my mom came to visit from Australia in her presence, and he, and he gave me this ring. So, Wow. Oh, I that's mean, beautiful. that's beautiful. I mean, you don't need a lot of things for a proposal, Aloe, but like a, a, <laughs> of the list of one thing, like the ring has got to make it on. Yeah. <laughs> hey, know. he technically found one. Right? Now, here's the thing, though. It's so funny hearing love stories. Like when Sean and I talk about our love sto- story, it's like the most embarrassing. It makes me look terrible. But in the moment, like it, proposing on a plane, the yeah. aluminum ring, it's like, like it just means so much more. Yeah. Like, you know, as as funny and as ridiculous as the story may be, it's like, it's awesome. I love it. I'm not, uh, a, I'm not a diamond girl. Like I never, you know, this is an opal. You know, I never said I need a diamond ring and da, da, da. I'm not a fancy person like that. So I think he knew mm. that. But, you know. <laughs> She still deserved her proposal moment to be something more special than. Well, you made it up. You made it up. Airplane moment. You made up for it with the I do video. (laughs) Okay, so fast forward a little bit longer. You guys have two beautiful babies now, seven and four. Mm -hmm. How is parent life treating you guys? (laughs) Yeah. I enjoy it. I love it. I, I, I'm happy to be a father. I think in our very first conversations, I had said something crazy like, I want seven kids. And then, mm. and then after having two, I was like, I want two kids. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> he said the same thing. He's like, I want a football team or something. And then we had our first one. And he's like, maybe one. Whoa, maybe one's good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, it hits you hard, the first one. Uh, it does. I'm, I love parenting. I think nothing prepares you for it, can prepare you for it. Um, and it's it's challenging because you, you don't ever know how you are going to be as a parent, so you can't even have conversations. You think you know, and then you become a parent, and then it's, wow, mm-hmm. to sleep drain, to not sleep train, sugar, no sugar, TV, no TV. Oh. I mean, it's just... Yeah. You know. So I'm sleep train, no sugar, no tea. <laughs> it's mm. like you, you walk around with your list. I am this. <laughs> she is that. Um, wait, so one of the most fascinating things we got, we read about you guys was the no TV. Mm. Not because it's no TV. Like, that's amazing. Um, but you guys don't do TV for your kids because you think it it takes away part of your kids' imagination. Well... So we noticed that our kids are extremely creative, Mm -hmm. but in the moments where there is, let's say we're flying 14 hours to Australia. (laughs) You get a lot of TV on those flights. When when we get to Australia, the next week is all of processing of this media that they saw, which is no longer their creativity. It is now, implanted from someone else's uh, ideas and thoughts Mm -hmm. about structures and and storylines when they're super creative on their own. So we want to be careful about what kind of messages they're getting from, you know, from, from elsewhere. Like my kids without, you know, some of the things they've seen probably wouldn't have a concept of like guns and shooting. Right. right. Mm-hmm. But it's on it's in the media. Right. And, and we're, we're like we're no gun family. So do we do we want to have these other ideas that we hadn't had a chance to, to broach the conversation mm-hmm. and talk about, OK, mortality, um, mm. 
uh, that's it. respect for life. Expo like, exposure is, is one thing, but there's, there's also um, a lot of research around how um, media in general is um, not the best developmentally for children. And for me, it comes from more that aspect of, you know, what happens to their brain when they're watching a screen and, you know, their brain making sense of all these pixels firing at them and just seeing for myself, like, if you watch children watching a screen locked in, they can't, they can't take their eyes off it. They become mm. like zombies, right? Mm -hmm. I, I noticed that afterwards my daughter would, you know, hit or kick, um, act out in ways that she would never be like, you know, other than, mm -hmm. than if she wasn't in front of the television. So I started noticing, okay, you know, I can see that this is sort of um, unwinding that needs to happen. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we, um, our children are in a Waldorf school, which is a mm -hmm. Rudolf Steiner education. And that's very, you know, they, they're rooted in, they have their reasons for no media, but they also introduced us to the neuroscience behind it. And it's sort of this idea that, yeah, you're going to get that 30 minutes for yourself because it buys you time to, you know, get the dishes done or get the, the food made or whatever. But then it, 20 minutes of watching causes like, needs about 40 minutes of unwinding from it and wow. they there's research that shows um you know in terms of comprehension and you know kids levels of comprehension are much higher when they haven't been watching as opposed to kids who have just mm -hmm. been in front of a screen so there's a lot of research around why it's not great for young younger children and you know we have it's not that we do none because i mean especially mm -hmm. in pandemic <laughs> their media time has yeah. never <laughs> gone higher we just try to really balance it and not do too much mm. and maybe leave it limited to Saturday mornings or grandma's house or, you know, just mm -hmm. that. It was crazy. I was, I was, I I was raised on TV. Like I had, yeah. I had eight hours of TV a day until I was probably <laughs> a sophomore in high school. And I was like, yeah. I'm good. I don't think I need <laughs> <Yeah>. ever. <laughs> Like almost cold turkey uh, TV, and um, and so I think there are merits for it. I think I I learned a, a whole lot, but I saw way more than I needed to see. It's yeah. also different. We don't have like now we have iPads that never ends and YouTube right. channels that never end that go on mm. and on. There's an addiction definitely, and then also it's what I've learned is there's a four billion dollar industry in marketing to our children. Mm -hmm. And there's this thing where they call, what was, it, what was the term that I was telling you about the other day? It's uh, fri something friction. Oh, yeah. Purchasing uh, friction. Purchasing friction. And this is the label that they give to parents that they we call us friction. purchasing friction. <laughs> so how do they remove <laughs> the parent away from the toddler so the toddler can buy things? Because you know that mm -hmm. when you're in the store and they market to your kid right in the aisle when you're about to check out and mm -hmm. it's just, Oh, yeah, they all know Same it. idea. So I don't like, I just, that bothers yeah. me. That a big industry is marketing to my child to tell them to get that LOL doll and to nag me for the next three hours that I have to yeah. buy it. Yeah. Anyway. So you, you as creatives would uh, appreciate that. I don't know if you ever heard of the book, uh, The War of Art. So the, the art of war is, is like oh, yeah. this ancient. Yeah, yeah. But that someone came out with probably 15 years ago, the, the, war of art talking about the creative process and um he talks about how the point that you get bored is really like when your creativity starts to absolutely blossom. love and it so so instead of mm -hmm. filling the boredom with you know consuming social media or reading the news or whatever like just sit there and see what your brain comes, comes up, up with it, and it yeah. might be crazy and weird but it also might be genius you know so those are the most wonderful times in our family, in our household, when, when the kids are um, trying to find something to occupy their time with, and mm -hmm. you see them in their own world, creating their own stories, building mm -hmm. their own universe. Yeah. And, and, and as a parent, you love it so much, you just want to go and squeeze them and hug them and just like yeah. cuddle them because they look like they're, they're having so much fun, but you also have to just kind of like, okay, let me give them their mm -hmm. time, space. And as soon as you make them aware of it, you break the fourth wall and they're like, you know, uh. and then they realize, oh, okay, can, can I do something else that- Can we watch? Yeah. yeah. Can we watch? 
Interesting. I'm, so, I, I'm, I, I, I want to ask a question. I, I'm curious. <laughs> I mean, you guys live in the entertainment world and there's something so beautiful about watching our babies just live in such this like perfect world where they're not touched by all of just the madness around them. But as adults, you guys live in the entertainment industry, which is chaos. How do you guys still find that separation as parents and as a family to have boredom and to keep keep it out of your family life if that makes sense yeah it's all it's all about simplifying life and brings me to another book Mm -hmm. (laughs) simplicity parenting which is an incredible book by dr kim john Payne, and it talks about not you know overpacking your schedule and filling Mm -hmm. up not just in terms of your schedule but simplifying your life all around with your stuff the information that comes into your house so we don't watch the news in front of our kids um, and we try our best to um, space out, you know, the weekends, like give, give time, give the days time to breathe, if that makes mm-hmm. sense. Mm-hmm. You know? Today's show is brought to you by Butcher Box. Uh, so I'm guessing you would like to tell everybody what we had for dinner last night. So this probably didn't come as a surprise to you listening because we rave about them all the time, but... I whipped up some of my special sauce wings last night, and boy, were they good. Andrew has been getting so much into grilling, and I love it. And those wings were fire. They were the best you've made so far. Well, I can't take too much credit, though, because Butcher Box, where we got our wings from, has the highest quality meats, and the best part is it's delivered straight to your door. Yeah, they really are the best. They have unbeatable value and are super customizable. I love that I get to pick out our meats for the month out and have options like 100% grass-fed and pasture-raised beef, free-range USDA certified organic chicken, heritage braid pork, wild-caught seafood like salmon, cod, scallops, and haddock, and butcher box bacon, which is sourced from heritage breed pigs and is uncured, nitrate-free, and sugar-free. So all of those words we just said (laughs) should just show you that this company really does care uh, not only about where the meat is sourced, but about who the meat's going to and how it affects the environment. I love it. So for those of you that don't know, the way it works is you choose your box and your frequency and they ship it straight to your door. Then you get to enjoy some of the best meats. It's seriously the best and we would recommend it to everyone. And I'll reiterate this because I do love their mission as a company. They're just all about sourcing the most sustainable meats while supporting animal welfare and farmers all across the country. Yes, so we are huge fans over here at the East Fam, and they are running a special just for you. If you want to try some Butcher Box, click my link in the description to get a free turkey. What? Perfect time of the year. New members will get a free turkey, 10 to 14 pounds, in their first order when you sign up for Butcher Box. Plus, shipping is always free. You can go to butcherbox.com forward slash couple today to claim yours. I honestly can't remember the last time we got meat from anywhere else besides butcher box. I know. It's it's the best. It's such the go-to. Check it out guys. Let's get back to it. This is something Sean and I have put a fair deal of thought into, but you both have reached fantastic success. Um how are you preparing your kids to when they're old enough to understand what success you've had to deal with that, you know? Hmm. So I think a lot of that comes down to um, making them feel empowered with their skill sets and offering them the skill sets now. So I'm, you know, this is an ongoing conversation and discussion, uh, which is the euphemism for argument about (laughs) how strict and how purposefully we want to educate our kids on any particular thing. I am of the mind that we are farmers and on a farm, everyone is active. The kids learn how to milk the cow and to feed the corn to the chickens and they learn how to sow, you know, sow some seeds. Our farm is music. Our kids should learn music. Not that they will become musicians and entertainers mm. in the future, but they should learn piano they should learn guitar they should learn voice songwriting 
these things are important because we have access to them. This is what we can impart on our kids mm. as a profession. Um, and then we are both of immigrant families that have a second language, Spanish in her family and my family. Our kids should learn this language. It, these, these are my philosophies, right? And I mm -hmm. feel like it's our job as parents. This is broccoli. You're not going to let them get away with leaving the broccoli on the table. I'm not going to let them get away with leaving the Spanish on the table or the instruments on the table. Mm. So that's my perspective, because once they're empowered with these tools, they can go on to have a career in what we do in music and have been fully informed as youngsters, or they could be the first, you know, astrophysicist working from the space station in Mars. But at least they had what we gave them because they, wow. they couldn't not have it. That's, that's, my that's a really convincing argument just from the standpoint of you. you, you, you. <laughs> well, no, just from the standpoint of like you are both musicians. That's what you know the best. So for you not to equip your child with what you're best knowledgeable of, you know, when you, when you do inform them of the, of your processes and your knowledge, like you take them down that road and on that path, they're going to learn a, a million different derivative things. They could, you know, Oh, maybe it's sound engineering, which turns into chemical engineering or whatever. But like, it's all because you were pointed towards this, you were leading them towards what you're an expert at. So not to, not to douse whatever argument you have Maya, but I'm convinced I'm sold. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> talking about really i don't it's not i don't <laughs> yeah i just see it as no pressure like i they're yeah. so young i'm like because i yeah. remember being forced to do piano and hating it and you know and i it didn't it didn't turn out well i love yeah. i would dance forever for hours and hours so I, i'm just like find what their passions are and then nurture that as opposed to like you have to sit and play piano for three hours so I'm just not in the strict mode. We can we can flesh this whole argument out right now. If you guys, no, if you guys just want to no, go no. at it, we'll just go live. But <laughs> around us all the time, they see us performing. They see us playing with the band. They see us writing, recording. She's. I mean, they're already getting it. They are. Wow. We don't. You know. Hey, so Allo, congratulations! You recently um, released your first album in seven years, as I understand it, um, and. It seems like you came about this album um, discussing things like family and fatherhood and kind of these more personal sides of life. And as Maya alluded to, your I Do video uh, was beautiful. You know, your your uh, the all, all of everything lyric video is about your trip to Hawaii. Tell us about this album. Yeah, this album is much more personal. It's much more about my kids, my wife. Uh, my relationship with my parents and my friends, more so than the past. Uh, songs that talk about connection and togetherness. And I feel like it's a way for me to bridge the gap with my fans and my audience um, about where I've been for the past seven years. Mm -hmm. And um, trying to find a way to humanize um, my artistry and connect with my fans in a way that they can hear their own personal stories in the songs mm. that they can say oh yeah this is what i learned from my dad or this is how i interact with my kids um or i like i like this song about relationship uh, it reminds me of my spouse did it take you seven years to develop it sort of did it was seven years of all kinds of different music and at the end of the at the end of the road i decided i wanted to tell the story about family that I hadn't told before. Um, wow. so there's a lot of other music that I could release that could be compiled in different thematic um, ways, but this was the theme that I wanted to focus on. Um, in sharing that album and kind of leading down the path of just more personal information, was there any hesitation between you two in sharing more personal information about you guys in your past and your family? 
<laughs> Am I just bringing up all the arguments and conversations? <laughs> uh, remember, okay, which one is about me? <laughs> which one? <laughs> so, I got, I got, I'd say vaguely personal. I think there's probably another album where I can get even deeper, but I would have to. Yeah, no thanks. I'd have to get permission. <laughs> Well, um, I can make an album too, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh my god. Uh, yeah. It's the kind of an inside joke because um, on the was it the Good Things album, Loving Is Kill Yeah, on the Good Things album, he released a song called um, "Loving You Is Killing Me," and I remember him performing it once at Amoeba, and his dad was next to me, and he turns around and goes, "Is this about you?" And I was like. I <laughs> <laughs> so, it's like you, you, know, you stand on the side and you're like that one's me that one's not nope that one's actually really not <laughs> yeah. you know for me as a hip-hop artist like everything i say is is true it's a real me experience mm -hmm. it's the world through my eyes as a songwriter you know he writes stories he's a storyteller mm -hmm. so they're not all about us or him some mm -hmm. of them are just stories and other mm -hmm. people's stories so it, yeah so this time around um i don't ever assume like the love song i do is that about me i don't know you know like i just yeah. okay, if it is it is but i don't assume it yeah so, and in, in yeah. when i wrote that song i was specifically trying to write a song to, about my relationship with maya and and something that would be special for us right um so and, then i was like oh that's sweet <laughs> <laughs> so you guys are impressive in so many ways including your thoughtfulness as you know as we heard maya with you talking about screen time and the effects it can have on children you guys seem to be knowledgeable and, and really diligent in investigating a wide range of topics and um i think it's fair to say that your activism i think you call yourselves artivists mm -hmm. is that correct can you can you tell us about that and your motivation behind that because it's rare a to seek out the degree of knowledge that you have and be be comfortable in vocalizing it mm -hmm. to the extent that you have mm. yeah artivism is the connection between activism and artistry using our voices for positive social transformation uh fighting for the underdogs speaking truth to power um i re when i signed a major recording deal i recognized the massive amount of influence i could have with my lyrics mm. with my interviews and and my celebrity, so I, I wanted to use it for good. And um, I have been in the company of and mentored by um, leaders like Harry Belafonte, who was one of the artists who was very instrumental in the civil rights movement here in the United States. Like the money that he made and the, the, his presence on television, just being a black man in segregated America was extremely influential but the money that he made would also go to like pay for hotel rooms for Martin Luther King and flights and, and, and um, bus rides and for, for civil rights leaders. So this is where I'm, I'm recognizing there's value in what I do beyond just the lyrics to be able to help um, communities that are marginalized, people that are most vulnerable. Maya, would you mind talking about, you're, you're involved with many organizations mm -hmm. but uh you know peace over violence community coalition just just tell us about these organizations you're involved with yes so i think as a hip-hop artist you know hip-hop was born in um new york city and just by definition it's it's a socially conscious aware art form um so fundamentally Allo and I, I think our foundation has always been strong because we've always looked at the world in that way of, you know, we love making music, we love our um, making art, but it's always been for a purpose. Um, and so when I got to Los Angeles, I, I worked, I volunteered a little bit with an organization called Peace Over Violence, who are a, um, a rape crisis and domestic violence um, center. And they also do a lot of uh, prevention and education work. Um, and Al and I became the spokesperson for their Denim Day campaign, which uh, brings awareness to sexual violence, it happens every April. And I decided to write a song um, called Never Said Yes, which is about affirmative consent. 
um, for peace over violence because I'm thinking, how can I, these organizations that we support, that we volunteer with, how can we lend our art in a way that's meaningful? Um, and I thought, you know, writing a song about that kind of sum, sums up the curriculum that they teach in, the, in schools, in high schools and middle schools, could be a good tool for them to use and for, you know, for young people to hear. Really just all, all about moving the conversation forward always, right, and just finding mm -hmm. different ways to um, spark conversation mm -hmm. and to process the information. So with Peace Over Violence, that's um, that where the spokespeople and, mm -hmm. and I did that song. And then Community Coalition is another org that we love to support. Yep. Community Coalition does a lot of work in trying to improve the educational system within the inner city here in Los Angeles, um, South LA. And they are a community-based organization that's looking out for the people who need the most help. Um, we found them through a friend who was working with them and we learned a lot you know i i was vaguely aware about the ju the justice system but they really helped me to understand this concept of what is known as the school to prison pipeline mm. and so when they um they educated me on the school to prison pipeline i wanted to use that discussion in my music video for a song called love is the answer where we're talking about if a child doesn't learn how to read by age by the third grade statistically they are more likely to go to jail and be in the system than any than anyone else and that the prison unions know this and so the prison unions use their massive influence to legislate for reductions in education in certain areas where they know it's going to be easier for them to get full occupancy. It's a business. And so when you recognize that they're treating it like a business, then you have to organize against that mm -hmm. and fight against that, um, that kind of power. Um, so I thought I'd create my own campaign of awareness to let people know the school to prison pipeline is real and we all need to be aware of it we have to push for measures in schools that are restorative justice rather than punitive measures where you're suspending students there's something going on if you're suspending a student there's something going on at home there's something going on in their mental life that needs restoration they don't need punishment what they need is a helping hand and mm -hmm. so figuring out ways to, to promote that kind of new thinking um, as opposed to the old way of thinking and the way that's being attacked. We're being attacked by capitalism in, in a lot of ways. I love that you said that. I, I work with a lot of kids throughout the year and something that I've always told parents and coaches and mentors is kids don't say something for nothing. It doesn't, they can't just come up with it. Mm -hmm. So if they're asking you a question or if they're making trouble or if like there's a purpose behind it and there's a meaning behind it and it's, it's not their, I mean, I don't want to say it's not their fault, but you know, it's not their fault. There's something else going on, like you said. So I love that. Um, how does that play all of the incredible work you guys are doing? How does that play into your, your home life with your kids? What do you, do you share all of this with them? How does that educational process start or that exposure? They get to see, they get to see the love and connection part of what we do. So mm -hmm. the communities that we go into and that we serve um, here in Los Angeles, we have that we're a part of and that we're part of. There's, there's an event called Fandango Obon, which is an inter intersecting the African American community, the Japanese American community and the Mexican American community with traditional folk music and dance from Africa, Mexico, and Japan. And they get to see how we're inter intersecting and, and, and communicating across cultures in that way. Um, we don't, and, I, and purposefully, we don't introduce them to the vitriol, the hate, the violence that is occurring amongst adults in this world because they are not adults in this world. They are still children and children largely are 
beautiful beings of light with open mm -hmm. hearts that are just happy to breathe air and, and play. So that I think is the space that they should live in, but we are also preparing them to have open hearts for every type of person and every type of culture. They've visited Cuba to experience um, the uh, Rumba conference where they learned about ancient um, religion and, and uh, music and dance. They've been to Tunisia where they've learned about um, the Islamic experience of, of Africa in Northern Africa. Um, they've been to all parts of Europe and seen, you know, these different experiences. And I think the travel really is, is really helpful. When we get to Australia, they've been part of Aboriginal ceremonies on the beach. And they Our get kids to see are very, I mean, look, our kids are lucky and they're, they're lucky. and they're privileged, you know, and I would say that, you know, when we talk about shielding and protecting them from these, you know, political conversations, that's a privilege. Like not mm -hmm. all uh, families mm -hmm. of color get mm -hmm. to have that, you know, some families experience violence in their home, police doing raids, uh, parents in jail, you know, all kinds of stuff. So I, I get that it's not always um, an easy thing, but I guess for me, it's if you can, then I think it, you know, if we can mm -hmm. build our children, then I definitely want to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so I didn't have, you know, my black children marching in the Black Lives Matter. We marched, we're mm -hmm. active, but I just want them to, you know, I don't, there's a lot of questions that my seven-year-old is asking and I don't want to tell her, well, there's a bunch of people that hate the color of your skin. Mm -hmm. Like that, that just at seven doesn't feel like that's a conversation mm -hmm. that needs to be had mm -hmm. right now. It's not saying that they're ignorant or shielded, that they're, they're not. They, they learn in other ways and they learn the beauty and they learn the history of their blackness mm -hmm. and they're, you know, immersed in that through community, family. Mm -hmm. um, Which is, you know, I think yeah. we, we are able to have this kind of experience and, and awareness of how to bring them up because we grew up in an era where there wasn't that, and, and in neighborhoods where there wasn't that much enlightenment on how kids are receiving and being uh, fed information. My first understanding and, and uh, education about blackness and school in school mm -hmm. was coming from a place of subordination, uh, tyranny, uh, you know, uh, colonialism and slavery. And it could, so, it so much could have been from a place of um, empowerment. Like here are the civilizations that existed. Here are the, the ways that they persisted and thrived. And then here is what happened from, you know, uh, a, a, a socioeconomic, you know, and political historic space. Yeah. But instead, mm -hmm. all I thought was black people were slaves and that's what, that's what they were. And then they had to fight for freedom. Not that there was anything prior or any, right? right? We, yeah, we, we were just talking about how, sorry, the first time you learn about something, it sets the filter or the lens or the angle from which you learn every other yeah. related thing. And so I think that's a powerful concept. But um, listen, back to your All of Everything album, you, you have songs like Harvard, which talk about class, <laughs> uh, Corner, which talks about familial support. Um, I Do, that we were talking about earlier, talks about marital devotion. I want to hear from each of you. Mm -hmm. I've never asked this question. Mm -hmm. We'll see how it goes over. How has your marriage changed your life? Mm -hmm. Oh, my, I know for sure it's made me much more empathetic, uh, much more compassionate, understanding. And it's still for me like an, a constant every day growing uh, and learning. But just being able to have a reflection and, and see who I am through her lens is, is making me uh, a better person and more aware. I, I don't think I, w I was as self-aware or as empathetic before I got married. 
do I have to answer now? <laughs> <laughs> Your turn. <laughs> wow. Um, thank you. That was nice. Um, ditto. Um, <laughs> it's hard. I don't know how his marriage changed my life. <sighs> I think I, I really enjoy the partnership, um, the intimacy, you know, have, living with your best friend. Um, a lot of the things that he said in terms of self-reflection and just, you know, being able to always have someone to share ideas with. But most of all, it's, it's becoming parents and raising children together and, mm. and navigating this journey who sings in the shower more between you two? Uh, probably me. <laughs> Brian, um, you guys are amazing. You guys are doing incredible things. It's really cool. I think it'll be really cool for people to listen to this and just see how you guys are working together to truly just like change a generation with your babies and just the impact you guys are doing for communities in the world. But the one question we always ask, um, our couples who are on the show is if you could give one piece of advice to anybody who is dating, anybody who is looking to be married, their partners, couples across the, the world, whether it was a piece of advice that you're given or something you came up with now, what would you say? It's a big question. Sorry. <laughs> I would almost, I think that we might have the same answer, but it's like, you can't, fully give yourself to someone else unless you know who you are um, there's so much work that you have to do we ultimately met when we were in our late mid to late 20s um which i feel like and we had both our own independent kind of um existence and and um income streams and that kind of thing and mm -hmm. i think that was a benefit because we both felt like she she certainly was super independent and could handle life on her own. <laughs> mm -hmm. I felt super independent. I could handle life on my own. And we made the decision that we were going to do this together. Mm. And, and then, of course, there was still a lot of individual work that we had to do once we met. But you got to know yourself and you got to learn mm. yourself. And, you know. Yeah, you can't you can't change anybody. You can only change yourself. So I think it's also important not to lose yourself in the relationship um, and continue to, you know, you have your own dreams individually and then you have your family dream. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a good balance, I think. Wow. Well, I'm, I'm pumped um, to <laughs> have this conversation with you guys. You, you have so much wisdom mm -hmm. and um, I'm pumped to, finally get an album the first one in seven years from you aloe <laughs> yeah. and we're going to link that down below for you listening uh it's this really awesome blend of i would say folk and soul probably <laughs> pop am i am i missing anything as far as inspiration there we are not uh, artists we might be butchering all I'm, of this i'm trying to <laughs> soul <laughs> there you thank go. you um but again it's it's this creative take on a lot of the things you're passionate about. And I think you mentioned that it, it all points towards this AIM philosophy, the affirmation, inspiration, and motivation. And so the songs truly have purpose. Um, it was just an honor. Maya, it was a pleasure to meet you. Allo, pleasure to meet you. Thank you guys so much for giving us the time and we're excited to, to stay connected. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, it was really nice meeting you both. Next time we need to interview you so we can hear your <laughs> Yes. Uh, okay. okay. Oh, man. Yeah. You don't want to hear it. Yeah. Thank <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thank you, guys.